Good evening. Um, I want to say a couple quick things about the state of California before we move on. Uh, you know, anytime people talk about carbon pricing, uh, one of the things we should point out is, is AB 32 was enacted in 2006. California's economy and jobs have outgrown the nation since then. So if you talk about there's a price on carbon and it's, it, it, it's going to hurt the economy, there's no evidence for that when you look at California. Now, on the other side, the emission reductions have not been exciting. You know, since 2006, uh, from 2006 to 2014, California had a 7% reduction in emissions. The country had a 9%. Now, there's a reason for that. You say, well, holy cow, it's completely failing. No, it's not completely failing. California was starting at a cleaner baseline. But nevertheless, the still, the emission reductions are not something that we should get too excited about, OK? Uh, the last point the gentleman made is, you know, I, I wanted to make sure I clarified something that I was talking about this morning. If there are state pricing initiatives, we'll be supporting them if they happen under another organization's banner. So we can't lose our focus. We are an organization that, that we are 100% for one thing. We're focused on one thing. We have our path going that way. And we don't want to lose that focus by confusing our people that we're doing two things at the same time. But if a climate exchange in Massachusetts or different organizations emerge, we will certainly encourage support for those, but it will be under the, a banner of a separate organization. Just wanted to clarify that also. Okay, so what, what we were hoping could happen for a few minutes tonight is um, we'd hoped that Marshall could come up a little bit and talk about the beginning of CCL. Uh, we will be officially 10 years old this October. So... And it's not a, it's a, not a long history to go way back to, so uh, again, you know, he, overall his health is way better than it was a year ago, but he has a really bad cold and we didn't want him to come. But I, I do want to remind you where the exact moment was that CCL came into existence. And that was, you know, Marshall went to see Inconvenient Truth, he and I had the exact opposite reaction to that movie. I didn't want to see that movie. I wanted nothing to do with it. I was convinced that global warming was way worse than I thought, and I was going to have this huge guilt trip laid on me about what I wasn't doing, so I reluctantly finally went to see it. And lo and behold, it wasn't a guilt trip. It was great. Remember at the end of that movie, they said, hey, don't worry about the whole problem. Just go change your light bulbs. I'm like, yes. <laughs> you know, I went home, I changed my light bulbs, and I said, I took care of it. You know, I've done my part, great, handled. Marshall had the opposite reaction. You know, he went to see the movie three times over about 10 days. And partially that was because, you know, he'd initiated a million microcredit loans uh, in the poorest parts of the world and saw those quickly being undone by climate change. And so he was one of the first people tra uh, trained by Vice President Gore. He started rapidly and passionately. You know, Marshall only has one gear. He gives every something all he has or he doesn't do it at all. It took me three years to convince him that he should let his assistant be off every year on Memorial Day. Because <laughs> he, just, he just likes to work and the only way I could get him to do it is I accused him of being an America hater. Now, Marshall's from Waco, Texas and you don't go kindly from being Waco, Texas being called America hater. At any rate, so Marshall's doing presentations and he gets one booked at, at a place that sounds like a pretty impressive facility so he's pretty excited about it. And so he gets there, and what it actually is, is it's a place with a retirement, with, a, with, with an important sounding name, but it's a retirement community with eight retired people sitting in a room that he's going to tell them about what to do about climate change. <laughs> Nevertheless, he enthusiastically goes through his presentation, and uh, at the end, there's only one question. And the one question is, are two of the new light bulbs better than one of the old light bulbs? <laughs> He goes, I don't know the answer to that. Um, and so then somebody said, a woman said to him, well, what actually needs to happen? What needs to happen? And what he said was, somebody needs to build a grassroots organization because we need a grassroots organization in every congressional district supporting Congress to do the right thing. And that woman said to him, why don't you do that? <laughs> she says, I'll help you. That's where our organization began. Our organization began when somebody said, will you do this? And I think that that's important, not just for that particular instance, 
that that's where our organization started, but just remember that that's what we're out there doing all the time is asking people to do something. They're not gonna do something by not asking them to do something. And so that's what we wanna be in the business of is asking people to do something so that they actually have a chance to step up and see what do they think the most important thing that could happen. So, you know, Marshall had the good fortune of having results as a model the whole time he'd been working on microcredit. He'd been doing it in partnership with, with results. Results proved that you would organize people by congressional district. If you um, had a good structure of support, you could actually get the Congress to do really interesting things. So I first came to the organization in 2009. And we were on the Hill during the Waxman-Markey debate. And um, after that, where the House did pass Waxman-Markey, and then the Senate couldn't come to terms with anything, and everybody went home really unhappy. There was over a 100-page criticism written by a political scientist at Harvard named Theda Scotchpole. And Professor Scotchpole's criticism essentially had two main points. One was all the support for that legislation existed inside the Beltway, and it needed to exist be back home in the district. That was the most important thing. If we were going to get something done, it couldn't only be done inside the Beltway. We needed to have support in every congressional district. The second thing was, whatever you do to mitigate global warming, people's costs were going to go up. So if the money didn't go back to households, people weren't going to support it. So we had six chapters at that point. And we actually thought we were pretty formidable on the Hill. Um, but it was interesting that what Marshall had concluded needed to happen going into before that, and then Professor Scotchpole's paper matched each other up with each other perfectly. You know, so he said what needs needed a grassroots effort. We fail in 2009, and this Harvard political scientist says, yeah, what was really needed was a grassroots effort. Okay, so now I'm just going to tell you um, how I ended up here. So Marshall came to me after he started the organization and he said, I'm doing this thing and I really need you to work with me. We'd known each other for 25 years. I'd done some work with him on hunger related issues and I couldn't really get my head around what he was saying. Um, in fact, I wasn't the only other person. One of our very first board members, John Reeves, Marshall had approached him. He, John had gotten an op-ed published in the San Diego Union. Marshall had asked to have lunch with him. Marshall was trying to explain to him what was trying to happen, this new kind of grassroots organization. John Reeves didn't know what he was talking about, but he called the local head of the Sierra Club, and he said, you know what, Marshall's working on this thing. I don't know what he's talking about. And Carolyn said, it doesn't matter what he's talking about. Everything he touches turns to gold. <laughs> so I, Marshall said he needed to do this thing. It was really important. He wanted me to work with him on it, and so I started meeting with him once a month. And um, it took me a while to get my head around what he was trying to do, but then one day it dawned on me that I said, Marshall, I think I finally understand this. What you're telling me is you want to work on global warming and Congress at the same time. And he goes, yes, you finally understood it. <laughs> so I said, this sounds really good. Not one of, but the two most screwed up things on the planet, you want to combine them. You know, I felt like had a, I'd had a pretty successful career. I'd done things with my life uh, I felt proud of, and it didn't sound like there's anything I could crash and burn more than with this. But I had a huge amount of faith with Marshall. And um, frankly, as much as I had tried to avoid what was happening with the issue, he would bring a little bit more science and my stomach would start to turn. So what I told him was, I would take a six-month leave of absence from my company. Uh, I was paying for three kids to go th through college at the time, so my expense base was pretty high. Um, but that I would take a six-month leave of absence, and I felt like I could, with a good conscience, help him get this started and then go back to doing what I was doing because I didn't want to transition into the nonprofit world. So I started working with him a little bit, and we went to Capitol Hill during the Waxman Markey time. And Marshall and Danny and Richter and I spent the day on the hill. And we were terrible. I mean, you, the, the, everything we tell people not to do is what we were doing. And um, I remember being in a meeting with Karina Neubauer in Senator Kerry's office who was trying to put a bill together in the Senate. And we'd been talking to her about 15 minutes and she closed her notebook. And she kept being great and gracious and listening to us, but it was obvious that the meeting was over from her standpoint and we just kept lecturing her. 
Yeah, it was brutal. So I went home that night just about as dissatisfied with anything I've ever done in my life. And what we'd really done is just spent the day on the hill trying to convince people that cap and trade was a bad idea and that a carbon tax was a better idea. And how many people like to be convinced that what they're working on is a terrible idea? I mean, you love that, right? Don't you love it when your spouse tells you if you just do a few things differently how much better the marriage would be? So I was kind of struggling with that that night, and uh, Danny and Marshall and I had breakfast the next morning, and I said, you know, that didn't work. How about if we go in tomorrow, and the only thing we do is we say, let's find out what we have in common with these people. That's the, our only job. And then let's see what happens. So we don't, we're not going to try and talk to them about legislation. We're not going to do anything. We're just going to go in there and see, do we have something in common with the person we're sitting with in, in the room? And every single meeting was electric. And it scared the crap out of me. Um, because I really honestly only was planning on putting six months in this. And that was the moment where I realized that if we did this the right way, we had a chance of success. And uh, I didn't like finding that out because I didn't want to be all in. But you know, we've all had that moment, right? Where you say, okay, this could work. And if I walk away from it now, could I look at myself again? Could I ever tell my kids, you know, we could have done this thing, but it was too hard? You know? So, um, we went back to the office and we started talking and Marshall said, I don't think you want to make this a leave of absence. I think you want to do this. <laughs> and I said, you know what? I don't think I have a choice. I don't think the choice is mine. I think that uh, if, if what we're doing has a chance of success, we don't have any choice about this. So anyway, that was in 2009. And uh, I'm excited that we'll be celebrating our, uh, our 10th anniversary this October, October 7th. We're going to call it our 10-10-10 event, because October 10th, but it's really the 7th. But anyway, you'll hear the plan.